I've called myself plant daddy for a long time, but it's time to specialize to Carrot King Kev. Guys, this is the year of the carrot. This is just one of hundreds in this row and hundreds in that row. I finally figured it out, which I will bestow upon you my carrot sowing secrets. And I'm gonna taste this one in a second, but I wanted to walk around today in the garden because it is the coolest spring garden I think I've ever had not only at this property, but in my life. So let's take a look at some of the experiments we have running because it's just lit right now. And I haven't used that word in a long time, but we're using that slang. This patch, the asparagus patch, this is the first year I've actually been able to harvest. So this one, honestly, it's probably a little past its prime. The way it's wiggling is disturbing. Honestly, it's just very, I can't stop though. It has been the year of the asparagus because asparagus takes like two, three years to get itself in a position to produce to the point where you can actually start removing some. So my green asparagus seems to be doing really well. I have like one lone purple that I decided not to harvest because I only have one, but actually, no, look at this. Look at this right here. I've got that guy. So who knows, I'll have to maybe eat that one. But I finally ate some. I chopped them up into like little two inch cubes and put them in a frittata because I've been getting way too many eggs. But it's cool to see the asparagus actually going. And then just a couple weeks ago, I showed you guys my orchard that I put in the backyard. This is gonna be the one that's using the water from the greenhouse. And take a look at this. I've got the four graft Asian pear. It looks like one, two have started to produce. This one's coming, but it's honestly quite slow. I only see like maybe one bud there. What I know now is for example, if these two graft points are growing faster than these two on the multi-graft, I'm probably gonna need to cut these down for a second year to keep this tree nice and balanced, which I learned from our friend Tom Spellman. I'll show you what's going on there in a second, but this is the one that was really the shocker to me. This is the double planted European pear. So there's the hood European and the Florida home. I'm actually, flabbergasted that there's this much growth. So remember when I put this in, I had pruned out this interior section because I planted them so close together. Well, it looks like I might need to get a little bit more aggressive there because I left this branch and they're already starting to kind of run into one another here. So as the year goes on, maybe I'll do a summer prune on this one because it's just way more vigorous than I thought. And then over here, this is the cherry that I put in. I think it's a Royal Crimson. Yeah, it's Royal Crimson. I can't grow a Bing cherry where I live. Just doesn't have enough chill hours. This is the sad one with Tom when he was out here. We ended up cutting this down from about this tall. We brought it down to here and it was just a very depressing cut. But as you can see, it doesn't seem to have hampered this cherry at all. This little guy is trying to put out some serious, serious branching, which is really good to see. I've noticed with cherries, they tend to just go wild across the entirety of the stem instead of having more of like a branching style structure, but we'll see how that goes. And then the persimmons. The persimmons are also growing really well. So I'm shocked that I got this good post-transplant growth because it's only been about two or three weeks and I'm seeing this much leafy green growth is actually wild to me. So maybe I'll get fruit faster than I thought. These bad boys here are actually a new line that we invented ourselves. It's called our Cedar Line Raised Beds. We have a four by eight, a four by four, and then we have a two by four and a two by eight elevated planter for you balcony gardeners. I don't know. I'm obviously a big birdies fan. I may be converted to wood for certain aesthetics. We actually flew up to the factory and come take a look at this. We have this little top sill that we put on. So we, we engineered this all ourselves. Nice little coffee sill here, maybe a tool sill, but then this side, little profile here. What we did is we went up to the mill, we custom cut this spinning bit that will profile all these cedar boards. It is super cool and I can't tell you how good it smells right now. So we're super proud about that, but right now all we're doing is just growing out a ton of greens in this one, a ton of flowers in this one, but this is the Epic Gardening test patch. So I have some experiments to update you guys on. The first being this weird little triangle of tomatoes. Might be a little bit hard to see with the wood chip mulch. So we're trying to answer in the test garden all sorts of like gardening advice you hear repeated all the time, but maybe you didn't try it out yourself. So in this case, we've got three tomatoes, same exact tomato, same age that we grew out from seed. And we're asking ourselves, is it better if you bury the stem? Is it better if you put it at the surface? Or even over here, we trenched it. So we kind of buried the tomato like this and bent it upwards. So this is one experiment we're running. Over here, we're running the great potato experiment of 2024. And the question here is, there's potatoes in a trench right here, spaced about a foot apart. 
there's potatoes planted with the roof stout method over there. And then over here, there's a potato planted 12 inches deep. There's a potato cut in half planted six inches deep. And there's a potato planted six inches deep that's just, just normal. So there's four different, five different really ways of growing potatoes. And we're gonna ask ourselves which one performed the best and maybe which one was the easiest to do. And then over here, remember that onion experiment I showed you guys maybe a month, two months ago on the channel? This one is really growing in. So over here, what we did, if you remember, is we put some fertilizer trenches in between these rows of onions. And then we planted the onions with standard spacing. So about six inch spacing. And then closer over there towards the camera, what we did is we planted them way closer together with no fertilizer whatsoever. So we're just saying, hey, does that actually impact the growth of the onions? And so far, I have to say, I think that it does. Because if you look over here, these are quite a bit taller. And especially on this edge here, they're not not tall, but they're just a little bit smaller and perhaps a little bit behind. And remember, these were all planted at the same time. Then again, there's that little patch right there that's kind of long. So we're gonna see, I'm not gonna say these are like scientifically valid experiments. These are backyard gardening, backyard science experiments, but I don't know, I think we'll still learn something. Then I wanna take you over to the pond. So over here, we've had our fair share of trials and tribulations, and it's mostly with getting the border planting of the pond well established but i'm proud to say i think it's the best it's ever looked so as you come over here first of all take a look at the koi these boys are huge now they are absolutely massive and i love it they're just kind of chunky and then we've got the lilies so it's just about getting to the season where the lilies are starting to bloom which is gorgeous and there's all these different colors it's sort of this like champagne pink blush on this one you got the more yellow ones over here and the lilies have really grown into this space and given our koi, just a little bit more air cover from maybe a hawk or something that might want to predate them. But behind me, I think is where most of the action has happened. So what we've done here is we put in some of these salvia, which are just showstoppers. Like these, I can understand why Laura over at Garden Answers is such an ornamental lover because I'm starting to get converted. So Laura, if you're watching, I salute you. But take a look. I mean, this is just an absolutely gorgeous plant that's really filled in. And in our climate, at least, it is a perennial. It's gonna come back and expand year after year. It's hard to see, but there's like dozens and dozens of bees just on this one. And then over here, there's also quite a few. But the thing we changed about this area is we had a lot of trouble getting this planting up here to actually establish itself. We kept planting it into the summer, which was frankly kind of dumb. And so this time we planted it in the middle of winter, which for us is pretty mild. And that allowed some of these plants to establish. So we have this nice grass, I'm forgetting the name right now, but it's putting out these gorgeous little stems with kind of this like purplish, bluish, pinkish kind of pompadour style flower. I don't really know exactly what that is. We'll put it up on the screen for you, but very gorgeous. And then we had some stuff actually established. So this English thyme that Jacques and I put in last year, some of it actually worked out. The rest of it down on this slope here did not, it died. But if you take a look at this, we only put in a couple of these, right? And so what you're seeing here is some layering. It's kind of layering itself on the ground. It'll fall flat and it'll root down and it just kind of spreads itself really nicely. This is exactly what I wanted to happen here. And then of course the showstopper would be the passion fruit, which has taken over the tank to such a degree that when I tell people there's a tank behind it, now they actually don't even believe me. And then finally, we've got a couple additions. So this here is the Pride of Madeira. This is what Jacques got in his garden that everyone always asks about. It's gonna put out these big blue conically shaped flowers or clusters of flowers that the bees just go insane for. I can't tell you how fast this has grown. We put this in, it was maybe about this big, I would say nine, 10 months ago. And it's like way, way bigger than that now. It's like four or five, six times bigger. And I'm starting to see these come up, which means we're actually going to get some blooms this year. And then this tiny little guy here is a gift from our lovely garden hermits, kind of in the shade, but this would be manzanita. So this is a native. This is a California native, manzanita. It's beautiful, beautiful wood. You'll see it on hikes if you ever come out to Southern California. We'll see how this establishes, but since it's a native, I have high hopes. And now I've been carrying this carrot for far too long. It's time to go back over to the patch and share with you what I learned that now makes me Carrot King Cat. First thing we have to do is put our money where our mouth is. Been carrying it around the whole video. 
Let's figure it out. Look at that. That's just exactly what a carrot should taste like to be. Better, in fact, than that BS you get at the grocery store. So. I, I weirdly choke on little bits of carrots. Like, I don't know how to eat or something. More than any other food I've ever had. But let's talk about how to grow them. So what we did this year, there's really three things I want to mention. Number one is if you have space, just plant them in a long row and let life be. It's way easier to manage because then you get to thin them in a more uniform fashion is what I'll say. So what I'll do here is I'll pull back the hair of the carrots and you can see the way that I thin these out. So take a look, look at the spacing here. What I've done is there needs to be at least an inch between each carrot top. So before there was like one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. So I came through arduously and pruned all these out. And what you'll notice is there's even a bit of like a zigzag pattern here. And that's because when we pulled the trench, we just kind of scattered the seeds in. So I'm going to come down to a different section, maybe over here. Maybe I'll show you a little bit more obvious example. So take a look. See, see this right here? This is a tiny little baby boy carrot that I forgot to thin out. And, and look, I mean, that's not ever going to get size. But if you think about how a carrot grows, so this one's probably going to be about, about that wide, about that much girth on it. So divide that in half, and you need to have at least that much clearance on this side and on this side. Or another way to think about it is as wide as a carrot is, there needs to be that much space between it and the center of the next carrot, right? So let's say it's gonna be an inch wide, you need this to be an inch apart because you're gonna have a half inch on this and a half inch on this. So that's like the very nerdy way to think about it. And I will say it's, it's a little bit annoying to come out and thin. So what I did is I threw on a podcast, I got the epic kneeling pad out to save my old decrepit knees, and I came through and just busted this out in maybe like, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half or so. And there's two ways you can do it. You can thin by pulling, so let's say this one right here, I might thin just by pulling. Why? Because what do I get? This is called a delicacy, my friends. This is like a chef's choice little baby carrot. You know you, you, know you could picture this on like chef's table on Netflix. Some guy is like, oh, like I just connected the carrot so much. Like da -da -da -da, and then like boom, overhead shot. And it says like delicate carrot. And then it's like one dish, you know what I mean? So this is actually quite a nice carrot. But if you're going for size, you'd still want to thin this out if it's too close to the others. The other thing you can do, if you don't think you actually have a root, in this case I do, but what you could do is just chop. You could just chop the top and that's going to end its life as well. Uh, but I wouldn't do that if you thought you had a root down there. And I'll give you a little bonus tip. So Beet King Kev is also here right now. Take a look over here. What I've done the same thing with beets. So if we come into the jungle, you'll notice I've spaced these beets very similarly. It's a little bit not great lighting, but you'll be able to see that. And you get some really nice size on these. So it's important to do this early enough that they actually get size. So what will happen is you'll sometimes have a carrot with this much green growth. And then when you pull it up, you don't get some big old juicy guy. And that's because it's so crowded. All it's really doing is throwing up a bunch of top and it's not being able to develop. So I would say in the first maybe month or so, maybe five, four to six weeks, let's call it, you want to do this thinning process. And I say four to six because you can actually get a baby carrot when you thin at that point. If you do it earlier than that, you're probably just going to want to come through and cut because it hasn't even developed any roots yet. So it's really up to you which one you do. But that's been the biggest difference for me, besides some of the classic tips like germination, where what we did here, because we direct sowed these in ground, is we scatter sowed a couple packets of carrots down the row, and then we put burlap, cardboard, etc., on top to make sure that it germinated. And after about a couple weeks, when it finally did germinate, we took that off and then we put it on a normal irrigation or a normal watering schedule. Uh, and then the only other thing I might say is you'll still get spotty germination with your carrots if you do that because they're just very finicky. So you can come through and spot fill the areas of the line that weren't actually so they were they, that didn't germinate, right? And so what you get there is you kind of get a weird version of a succession sown row of carrots. You're sort of plugging the gaps, but in doing so, you're offsetting your carrot harvest by about two weeks. So you get a little bit of extra yield spaced over the season that way. But this is probably my favorite bed in the spring garden right now. 
carrots, beets, carrots, a nice little root crop sandwich. My girlfriend crafted this incredible shaved carrot recipe. It's kind of like an Eastern European thing. Don't tell Jacques, but she's like way better at being an Eastern European and he's, she's not even Eastern European. But so don't tell Jacques, don't go over to his channel and tell him that he's not even as Bulgarian as my girlfriend is, who isn't even Bulgarian because she made a better carrot salad than he could even dream of. I'll leave you with that. Good luck in the garden, guys, and keep on growing.